Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Rangers Review Morning Briefing for Tuesday, the 15th of November. I'm Derek Clark, and I'm joined this morning by Joshua Barry from Rangers Review HQ. How are you doing, Joshua? Good. Uh, absolutely horrible day today in Glasgow, Derek. Got so to come in, but apart from that, um, looking forward to trying to break down some of where it's gone wrong. Um, shame we don't have any positivity to talk about in the international break, but here we are. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, absolutely chucking it down here, uh, down in Warrington Way also. And Aldo says, uh, morning, everyone. I won't say good morning as it's chucking it down here in Clyde Bank. So, uh, yeah, grey skies uh, overhead. Uh, and that's, uh, it's, it's, you could say that's a metaphor for, for, for Rangers mm-hmm. this season uh, as well. It's been a, uh, a largely disappointing campaign. We'll, we'll get into the Rangers chat shortly. Just a reminder, though, folks, uh, as you can see the little ticker below, we've got the tremendous offer on the website, just a pound for two months' worth of content. Um, just head over to rangersreview.co.uk forward slash subscribe for all the details. Um, you won't be disappointed. It's uh, some superb stuff on there. Uh, and uh, whether you're into your, your stats or your nostalgic pieces, big interviews, you name it, uh, there's loads on there, um, so head over to rangersreview.co.uk and also if you can see the little ticker on the screen, uh, if you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel, that's totally free uh, and you will get a, you should get a notification whenever we go live. Every weekday morning we come on and talk all things Rangers and I was asked yesterday whether we're taking a break like the Rangers coaching staff and players and I'm afraid not, folks. We are here talking no. Rangers every single weekday uh, from here on in. So, uh, yeah, you'll get your, your, your daily fix of, of Rangers news. Uh, and uh, starting on the news, Joshua, I wanted to touch on comments made by Brian Loudrop. Now, this is in response to Giovanni Van Bronckhorst's original response to Loudrop's comments um, where he said uh, he was criticising the Dutchman's body language on the touchline uh, and Van Bronckhorst came out last week, uh, I'm, sh- I'm sure it was, and said that he called the comment stupid. Uh, now Loudrop has since uh, commented, and I'll just read you what he said, uh, last week I spoke about Van Bronckhorst's body language, his whole demeanour really and whether it looked as low, he truly believes he could turn things around in terms of recent performances and results. I know he responded to me with some comments of his own. He was perfectly entitled to do so. I have no problem with that at all. But I stand by what I said, because the point I was trying to make was about the impression it gave to others, including players. I was thinking back to my time, and whether I'd seen a manager look the downbeat way Van Bronckhorst did, as his team lost to St. Johnston. Even in Van Bronckhorst's own playing days, he might have wondered what was going on if the manager didn't look as if he could change things or turn it around. Um, he said the Dutchman has been through so much this season. Saturday's one all draw with St. Mirren was yet another blow. It was more of the same, really. Uh, after the game, Van Bronckhorst spoke about not being certain whether he would still be in charge after the World Cup break. Again, to me, it looked like someone who wanted a decision to be made on whether he is the man or not. Um, interesting. I, I don't like to see this now. Brian Loudrop, of course, an absolute legend uh, at Rangers. Joshua, I think when we had David Edgar on last week, um, we were discussing the comments that, that Van Bronckhorst made and how uh, it, it was lapped up. As soon as he made them, you knew there were going to be headlines Uh, in the papers the following day. Loudrop Sins came out. Uh, I think there's an element of truth in what he said. You could argue that, I mean, and Van Bronckhorst would argue himself that what does it matter in terms of his body language on the touchline? It's it's what happens on the pitch. Um, But it's it's, it's one of a number of things that have been pointed towards the manager because results haven't been delivered. Yeah, and... I think, as we said at the time, when the comments um, by Gio initially came out, because, you know, what Loudrop said, probably people inside Rangers will will think that's not ideal and won't want that to happen. But, you know, everyone knows what newspaper columns are like and what ex-players say and how, you know, opinions are just always flying around. So Van Bronckhorst will know that. It it seemed almost intentional that he chose to speak back at that as opposed to just saying, look, it's his opinion etc etc which would have just kind of quelled this and would have met, meant that there wasn't this you know so-called back and forth but I think that's the type of thing that happens when 
managers under pressure. Um, you know, Van Bronckhorst for me is, is you've been able to see, and we spoke. I think we spoke about this after the game on uh, on Saturday. Kind of almost how flustered he's, he's looked at points. I, I don't think I, I'm not saying that's a, a body language thing by any means, uh, but you, he's been visibly frustrated at the touchline. There was one moment where where Tavernier kind of barked back at him when uh, the manager wanted him to play forwards. Um, and, and, and you know, at Rangers, similarly to St. Johnson, the week before, they had time to turn the game around, but they kind of felt like the players on the pitch went into panic mode as, as soon as they went behind. There was an, almost an inevitability about it. So one of these things that doesn't help the the circus that's going on, and, and I'm sure the, the manager um, will have not appreciated because of all, all the pressure he's under. Um, but, you know, I, I, as I say, Derek, I think when he is under pressure, it's the type of thing you do bite back to as opposed to just kind of killing it in the first instance, which maybe he, you know, should have done in, in the first place. Yeah, uh, those comments are on the, the Rangers Review website, folks. You can, you can have a, a, a read at them. Uh, Scott Patterson says, God has spoken. You listen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, what a player he was uh, in his day. You, you'd have been too young to watch him, Joshua, uh, when he was playing for Rangers, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm born in 99, so... Um, just a oh, bit to you, but I've heard all like anyone of my dad's age. My dad's fifty-two, so um, a bit older than you, Derek. But Brian Lowdrop, obviously, his favourite ever Rangers player as well. So, I've seen the tapes, seen the tapes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he was uh, he was superb. So, uh, yeah, you don't want you don't want to read that uh, the manager that. Uh, uh, and a war of words you could see with uh, a club legend. Uh, moving on, Joshua, uh, I wanted to touch on. Well, I'd rather not talk about it, but let's touch on where Rangers have gone wrong recently. Now, I know there's talk around the manager. As it stands here on Tuesday morning, uh, we've heard nothing uh, untoward as to what's happening with regards to his future. Uh, now, Pigeon Strangler says GVB is back in Holland for the next five weeks, apparently. He's not there for the next five weeks. Uh, he's off. The, the, the coaching staff and players are off for two weeks. He did tell us that he was going back to see his family in Holland uh, I think uh, last week, I think it was, uh, on Sunday. Um, so that was always planned. Um, he does uh, live over in Glasgow uh, with his family back home in, in Holland. So that was always on the cards. Um, but he won't be there for, for five weeks, unless, of course, uh, a change is made managerial uh, lay. But uh, he's due back, uh, I think, in two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, Joshua, performances on the pitch have been poor, to say the least. Results have been poor. Uh, now you've done a, a bit of uh, you've you've analysed uh, where it sort of went wrong for Rangers in the last few matches: Livingston, St Mirren, uh, St Johnston. What's going wrong? Yeah, well, obviously, just to kind of re reiterate your point, Derek. No news of any uh, of anything as of yet. Obviously, the manager naturally is under a lot of pressure because Rangers. 15 games into the league campaign and they're nine points behind that. Um, you know, failure in domestically up to this point by any by any metric. We know that there wasn't any uh, crisis talks held after um, the defeat against St. Johnston. Uh, um, and as you say, there was a, a plan to kind of break for the players and managers, as will be the case all around the uh, world. The news, obviously, at the moment, yeah, yesterday, Derek, I was looking back at those three games and the conclusion I kind of came to, and you can read this piece in the comments, uh, sorry, sorry, in the, in the description um, of the YouTube and the Facebook page or on our website. Um, Rangers got two points from nine against St Mirren, St Johnston and Livingston. And th th that's obviously terrible. It's a terrible run of form. You can't pick two points up from nine against those three teams if you want to, to win the league. Um, but the, the I think the most pressing concern or the most concerning thing when you look back on that is that they didn't deserve to get anything more really than they did. They had a lot of the ball. Um, but going back to something that Martindale said after Rangers uh, dropped points against Livingston at Ibrox, um, and I'll get the quotes up for you now, but effectively he said, um, up until the sending off, you remember that uh, Livingston went down to 10 men. I think we were in control. It may not have lo not looked like that because we gave up possession. We knew we could deal with crossed balls from wide areas. We stopped them. We limited them to very little. We knew we would probably get a few opportunities and had to take them, which we did. But aside from the strike from Lundstrom and a save from our keeper, I don't think we had to worry a lot to worry about with 11 men. I genuinely think we'd have picked up three points. And 
you know, I'm, Rangers were very close to getting no points in those three games. Obviously, Lundstrom scores in the last minute at home to Livingston after Kent kind of pulls something out of the bag. The only reason they get points, uh, a, a point against St Mirren, you know, I was there at the, the stadium. Everyone watching on TV will have seen how limited Rangers looked when trying to break down the opposition. And again, St Johnston, as we discussed in the past, yes, they might have had 29 shots, but if you look at the quality and the location of those chances, I don't think that does justice. Again, how um, relatively comfortable the defending team would have been because they know they're going to give up space to Rangers in certain areas and they probably think that Rangers are going to struggle to break them down. So it, it's a bit of a look at that, um, which, as I say, you can read in, in the, the, the link in the, the, the description. Um, and that, for me, is, is as damaging as anything over the last while because Rangers have so many more of these games to come and, yes, they'll have players back and, yes, confidence probably won't be as low as it was after the Champions League defeats and the drop points domestically and the old firm defeat back in September, which has kind of, you know, caused this malaise up until now. Um, but when you look at, the, I think, the trends, the underlying trends from these games against teams that you need to beat and games that you need to win if you're going to win the league, there isn't any encouragement from those three games. So, um, yeah, maybe not the, the cheeriest of reads, but hopefully it adds a bit more context as to, to why Rangers have struggled and, and kind of cuts through some of the, the noise from all those three games. Yeah, uh, interesting. And there's also a piece on the website, Josh, you've done on uh, Antonio Cholak now. He enjoyed a, a blistering start to the season, 11 goals uh, in the league. It's actually when I was doing a piece on Morelos, um, it was interesting because he's got 11 goals, Cholak, already. Uh, and Morelos has, has had 12 in the last uh, 12 goals in, in the league uh, in each of the last three seasons. He has three this campaign, but it just shows you uh, he's never been prolific, Morelos, uh, domestically. Uh, and Cholak certainly has started off like a train. However, they have dried up, Josh. And we know he was missing on Saturday. I think he would have done a hell of a yeah. lot more than what Alfredo Morelos done in Paisley. However, he, he, he had a knock. Um, but you've done a, a piece on... The goal drop uh, with regards to the Croatian. Can you give us a, a little snippet of, of what you found? Yeah, well, obviously, it's goal drops relative, as you say, to the, the speed that Cholak started with. So I'm just getting the numbers up in front of me. But yeah, he, he has 11 uh, goals and 14 starts. But if you take into account the minutes that he's played, um, that's uh, 0 0.9 goals per 90 minutes. So almost, I, I, if you'd offered that after his first game away at Livingston, I think him and uh, all the supporters there that day would have, would have definitely taken that. But you're right there if you've got 10 and 9 and then 1 and 5. So that's not something I think to be hugely concerned about at all. I think it's probably natural um, to a degree for strikers to have that kind of spell in front of goal. But again, it adds more context as to why Rangers have, have dropped these points. Um, and again, it, pr it probably shows how over-reliant they were on him at the start of uh, the season. I think he scored about just over 30% of Rangers' goals in the league. Um, but... He overperformed his expected goals by about by about double, and if you don't know what that means, or if you hate me, if you hate the expected goals terms, all that means in this context is he was finishing above average. His finishes were very were, uh, were very good. And um, if you think about the think about the bicycle kick against was it Ross County when Scott Wright pulls the ball back to him? Um, is that am I thinking of the right goal? Yes. Yes. Finds a far corner. You know that you know the one I mean, or yeah, 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 the goal yeah, yeah. from outside the box against Dundee United, finding the corners constantly. These aren't easy finishes. Actually, only two of his goals have been from inside the six yard box, Derek. Um, so he overperformed that. So it's always gonna kind of naturally regress back to you you'd imagine something towards the mean, and still those eleven goals have come from about seven expected goals. So he's still, you know, finished um quite quite a lot above average and that he might continue to do that because he's a very good finisher comparatively to, to the league he's playing in probably but there's just some interesting trends and you can go and these shot maps and the piece again it's on the website or in the description particularly where if you look all of where Cholak's goals are from and again we did a piece earlier in the season Derek highlighting this highlighting one of the few kind of attacking um, trends that you could recognize if you will was those cut back cross into Cholak to allow him to finish across his ball at the end to the far corner he's far more potent from the right side than the left side and you can see that in his, his shot map I think about seven or eight of his goals are from you could almost throw a cone around them from the position they are in the penalty box um, and if you look at that kind of second run of matches where he scored one goal in five there's a lot more block shots in that area the shot locations aren't quite as good even though the quality of chance he's had hasn't dipped all that much so I guess a combination of maybe teams uh, learning a little bit about where he finishes from and um, the fact that he's maybe playing against slightly deeper defenses in these last couple of games uh, as mentioned but yes yeah, so, some interesting stuff in there again it's not a hugely alarming um 
this is why the goals have dropped off. Just a bit more context as to why 10 and 9 and then 1 and, one and 5. And hopefully it kind of explains that a little bit. Yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, I wanted to touch on this. Uh, Louise Wise, a uh, friend of the show, uh, comments and should have brought uh, brought a young striker in. Uh, I wanted to touch on this, Josh, uh, and tie it in with uh, Alfredo Morelos. Um, of course, he's been uh, chastised for his performance uh, on Saturday. Chris Boyd, Neil McCann uh, and others uh, criticising him. Uh, he's, he's not been in the best of shapes. He looks disinterested. Of course, we all know about the contract situation. Um do Rangers need to go out and bring more reinforcements in in, in, the, in the striker department come January? For me, I reckon they, they certainly do. Um, there could be an over reliance, well, there is an over reliance on Antonio Cholak to get the goals. Kimar Roof is uh, injured more than he's available. Uh, and then you've got the two young lads, uh, Robbie Ewer and Zach Lovelace. Um, Rangers need more in that department, do they not? Yeah, I, I thought your piece kind of summed it up really well yesterday, Derek. Um, Morelos, if you watched that performance uh, at St. Aaron Park, was just, the ball bounced off him. Um, there was that moment where he switched play and, you know, sort of obviously attracted the irritations of his manager, um, who, you know, I was sitting right behind him and he went and told Robbie Ur to, to warm up. Um, I don't know if that was just to, you know, a tactic to, to for Morelos to see on the pitch that Ur was, was warming up. I don't know if it ever crossed his mind. I think making a decision like that would almost kind of be an end of days admission from a manager. So uh, I'm not surprised that he didn't do it. But he was obviously very frustrated at Morelos and, and justifiably so. Um, there's so much in this because he's just come back from his first real long-term injury at Ibrox. Um, and maybe we haven't given enough consideration to the fact that that will have impacted him. But why is that? Because of his attitude problems of the, in the past, because the way that the manager came out and obviously criticised him so heavily before that PS, uh, PSV away game. Um, and I think that probably tells you enough um, about the circumstance and what it's been like uh, at, at the club. So th there's just so much indecision at the moment. Will Morelos, I mean, I don't think he'll sign a new contract at the moment um, because we've not heard anything about it. The manager said he was very positive about it at a recent press conference, but it's difficult to distinguish whether he was just talking about being positive in general. Obviously, going back to the summer at the training day, I think he said to Sky Sports that he thought it was quite close, but it's a very diff different situation then as it is to now. And, you know, we've spoken for a few months about the fact that you can't just keep Morelos on the bench all season almost if you want to keep him. You're not going to get the best out of him because I think he needs matches to get sharp. Um, but also, if, if you're trying to get him signed up on a new long-term deal, which does he merit the money based on his performances at the moment, I wouldn't say so, um, then playing him on, put him on on the bench for the whole season isn't the way to do that. But then also we look at Cholak's goal return. You presume how many goals he's going to score in the league? 20 in north of 20. Morelos hasn't hit that for Rangers in, in five seasons. So, um, yeah, much like the Kent situation, the Templars out of contract, there's just so much indecision at the moment and so many others. Yeah, uh, yeah. Listen, only Alfredo Morelos knows what, what's going uh, on uh, with him at the moment, and um, but but certainly Rangers aren't getting value for money as it stands. Uh, Colin Cooper gets in touch. Uh, where's Big Bad Johnny of the day? He's on a, a well-deserved uh, week-long uh, holiday, Colin. So uh, be, you'll be back uh, next week. Uh, and he also raises a, an interesting question. I wanted to put to you, Joshua, because you were there on Sunday, and it was interesting to see his uh, solicitor come out. Uh, yesterday to try and uh, clear the air and, and, and put an element of truth to it. Um, he says, uh, Josh, what's happening with Kamara and Gio and also Lowry and Gio? Gio have they fell out? Uh, the Kamara and Gio one, uh, there were reports that there was a falling out at half time. Uh, of course, he was uh, removed, substituted at the break uh, against St Mirren. Uh, Amar Anwar, the uh, solicitor, actually came out, which I've, I've never, don't think I've ever seen that before coming out to uh, deny this and said that, that, that Kamara, sorry, that respects the manager's decisions, always has done, uh, and it was a, a falsehood. There's no uh, uh, falling out. Um, did you notice anything at the game? No, well, as you say, Derek, obviously there was some reports of a falling out and then. Um, uh, the, the solicitor for, for Kamara said that um, there was no disagreement. Um, 
and that, that that's on the website. I would just read the quote here. His position is that there was no absolutely no disagreement. Um, and any attempt to say there was is based on pure speculation of falsehood. Glenn is the utmost professional and has been res has always respected the decisions that the manager side of of the story there, but that's strenuously denied uh, by Kamara. Um, what he did has been hooked a number of times at half times. Um, and it's another player. Again, we've got a piece on the website about this this morning. We're not short of topics today uh, on the Rangers review, Derek. Um, you remember him in PSV and how good he was. You remember the fact that he signed that contract a year ago and it was so celebrated because he was seen as a cornerstone of this team. I think he's a player that stylistically is not um, benefited from the change of manager because Van Bronckhorst like slow build up. Uh, sorry, sorry, Gerard like slow build up as midfielders coming to get the ball off the defenders. Van Bronckhorst prefers his number eights to run beyond, um, which we've seen Kamara do, and I don't think it always suits him as well. Um, but also, uh, it worked in Europe. They play these functional roles because he's so technically good and obviously tactically disciplined enough to do that. But in, domestically, he's hardly played and he's too big an earner, too important a player, too valuable a sellable asset to, to not be in the picture at all. So another one of these situations at the moment, Derek, that kind of epitomises um, the difficulties uh, at Ibrox. And um, he, I didn't think he was great in the first half, but I didn't think a lot of players were great in the first half. So um, by no means do I think he was the kind of the, the, the main suspect and also I just think that role slightly higher up the pitch just just doesn't suit him um, we know he played at the base of midfield when uh, Van Bronckhorst first came in I think that had good bits but also he needed someone alongside him and, and ever since he's not really had a consistent run domestically in the team so um, yeah in the newsletter today we're kind of saying is it inevitably he goes and, and it's, you know it's hard to see how he plays a big role on the Van Bronckhorst after a year particularly when you know, regardless of the, the discussion about disagreement, which we've already kind of covered, um, you know, Van Bronckhorst said after he was quite sharp, I thought, in, in a TV interview when he was saying I need, they needed more runs from midfield. That's all I'll say about it. So, um, you know, he definitely wasn't happy with his performance um, based on the fact that he took him off at halftime, you'd, you'd expect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you're getting uh, a few pilters for the, the, the Wi-Fi uh, connection, Josh. Ian Campbell said Josh's internet uh, not very good. You're breaking up slightly there, but uh, Blue Nose says Josh broadcasting in Morse code with the breakup on his McDonald's Wi-Fi. Uh, other Wi-Fis are available, folks. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit uh, uh, sluggish in uh, in the. Uh, uh, and uh, where Josh is at the moment in Glasgow. We just caught the gist of what you were saying there. Um, I wanted just to cut, touch on a, a number of uh, other comments before we uh, break up for the day. Uh, this comment here from Craig Marshall, uh, I'm sure it's uh, tongue-in-cheek. Uh, he says, I've heard Ronaldo is available. Let's sign in January. Uh, I know not Rangers-related, but what's your thoughts, lads, even if a Rangers player did a similar interview? This is, of course, Ronaldo's interview with uh, Piers Morgan in which he's basically slammed Manchester United and said that he's uh, been forced out the club. Uh, got to say, I don't think he comes across relatively well here. Uh, Ronaldo, Joshua, I don't understand uh, the reason why he's done this. Um, and uh, it can only lead one way, and I think uh, it will lead to an exit out of uh, the club. But if a Rangers player did this, could you... Could you imagine a Rangers player doing doing like this? And what, what did you make of the interview itself? Yeah, I don't. I, I agree. I don't think it's shown him in a, a brilliant light. I don't think it would be very well received. Uh, no. Put it that way, Derek. Um, and yeah, I think I think the fallout tells you tells you everything you need to know from it. But it was entertaining for for the those on the outside. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, certainly it's that, but not if you're a Manchester United supporter, that's for sure. Uh, and we'll just uh, finish up uh, just with this, these comments uh, that of uh, Barry Ferguson has actually uh, uh, been seen to be uh, have made, um, where he insists that uh, if Rangers need a former player within their first team coaching staff, he says that he would not turn it down. If he was approached, uh, he says, you don't need to ask me that. He was talking on the, the radio station, Go Radio. Um, he said, I think you know that Rangers is my team. I was lucky enough to have the privilege to play there as captain and win so many trophies. So, of course, I would be. I would be lying if I said no. Listen, I'm enjoying my life just now. It's nice and quiet, but I do think it does need people in there that know the club, the demands and the expectations. There's people out there that know and that are not in a job doing similar to what I'm doing just now. A bit of punditry. I do think it's certainly needed. One springs to mind, like a Neil McCancy, who has done a bit of management. I think it needs that players that like to come in and help the manager. It's something that I think is badly needed, no doubt, in my mind. Glasgow Rangers is an institution you're brought up in winning. You've got to win every single game. 
That's what I think is needed brought back into the club. Um, what do you make of these comments, uh, Josh? I think he's never hidden the fact that he would love a return to uh, Ibrox. And I see some of the comments on today's video uh, suggesting uh, people saying that they would like Barris, people saying that they don't want him anywhere near Ibrox uh, in a coaching capacity. Um, where do you stand on this? And, and do you feel that his point about an ex-player going into the dressing room, perhaps, and telling them the demands. I uh, think that rings true, or is it unfair on Giovanni van Bronckhorst, who has been a player at Ibrox before? I guess, um, yeah, so some people would tell you that that is not how players will respond these days. Other people like Barry Ferguson, who have obviously had a lot of success at Rangers, would, would maybe tell you otherwise, Kevin Thompson is also a name um, that's been discussed. I mean, I, when I look at the situation at the moment, I don't think the issue is that Rangers don't have someone in there who is telling the players what's expected of them or they aren't being shouted at enough. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how... Um, I, I don't know if players, as I say, respond to that in the same way. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it depends on, on what you think the role of a coach and, and manager is. And as I said, Ferguson gets, I, I think, a lot of um, people who would like to see him back, a lot of people who wouldn't. He obviously yeah, certainly does, that. as you say, know the demands, but um, yeah, I guess it depends on what you think the role of a coach is. Yeah, Dean McPhee says, McCann, a big yes uh, for me. Um, I thought he did an okay job when he was at uh, Dundee. I'm sure he's had a, a, one or two jobs other than that. Uh, wouldn't be opposed to that. Always enjoy uh, listening, him, uh, listening to him on, on Rangers TV, uh, and I wouldn't be opposed if he was... Uh, part of a, a coaching setup. But uh, as it stands, uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst is the manager uh, and there's been no change on that uh, as yet, folks. Uh, if anything does change, stay tuned to uh, our social media channels and also the website uh, and our YouTube channel as well uh, for all the latest from Ibrox. Okay, that'll do us there. We'll be back again tomorrow um, but uh, to talk all things Rangers as ever, unless uh, something takes place before then. Uh, so until Wednesday, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.